to get Bitcoin out to the world, we need to be like living this like lifestyle that is awesome, that like represents like a Bitcoin lifestyle, right? That's like, you know, super healthy, doing all, all the stuff that's like, um, you know, like freedom, sovereignty, health, you know, just like living this ultimate lifestyle and then getting that out to the world and sort of connecting this lifestyle with Bitcoin and people go, oh, this guy's living this like really great life and he's into Bitcoin. Like what's this like correlation sort of thing? That Shannon, Sonny, I appreciate you guys uh, allowing us to pull you away from that beautiful swan house over there. I, I have not been inside, but I heard it's pretty amazing over there. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah. How, how long have you guys been there? It's been like a week and a half now, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's been really awesome to hang out. With the so crew. You, kind of, you came in before adopting Bitcoin or? Yeah. Okay. So I know we were chatting a little bit beforehand uh, about your guys' journey for the last couple of years, but we didn't talk about your Bitcoin story. So I'm curious as to where that came in, who brought the Bitcoin component in, and uh, how that, what role that played in, in your guys' decision to leave Australia. Yeah. Oh, well, I was introduced to Bitcoin through Sunny. Um, and I guess I'm still on my learning journey now. Um, yeah, we are living in Costa Rica at the moment, so it's definitely prominent in the area that we are in. I suppose my role in the space has been like documenting my learning journey and my experience living in a circular economy and yeah, translating that to my audience, which is definitely more than just Bitcoiners. It's like a range of people who, yeah, know about the subject. So you were doing content before you, you got into the Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. I was a content creator. So what has your audience thought of you bringing a Bitcoin component in? Has there been any pushback? Is it? Um, everyone on Twitter really resonates with the Bitcoin documenting content that I'm putting out there. Um, I share a lot about my story over on Instagram and TikTok, and that seems to be like a newer audience. There's a lot of questions like on a lot of the basics and yeah, yeah. not too much pushback, just like a lot of questions. And what type of content do you? Do you shoot like what is yeah yeah it's typically my pillars are like health wealth sovereignty and acrobatic archery acrobatic archery yes okay yeah i think i may <laughs> now that you say that i think i may have seen something at some time did you have something where you were like shh, like all bent over like shooting an arrow into something yeah, yeah. Oh, that so, was you. Yeah, yeah. Was, okay. <laughs> yeah, I host, I hold the Guinness World Record for handstand foot archery. So yeah, maybe like one in every five, maybe ten posts is like a foot archery shot in amongst it all. <laughs> okay, we need to see that footage. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I know we didn't we didn't get any uh, yeah. we, didn't, yeah. we didn't prep any of that. Yeah. That's so funny because I I remember seeing that somewhere, yeah. But, yeah. but like a while ago, like a year ago or something. Yeah, it's definitely one of the things that have gone mega viral for her, like multiple different videos have sort of really gotten, you know, tens of millions of hits all over the internet. Yeah. So how in the world did you get into that? Like, what is the pathway one takes to get into acrobatic foot archery? Yeah, yeah. my, my parents put me into gymnastics when I was like five years old and um, did that throughout my childhood. And then when I finished school, I began, uh, doing like street performing and circus arts. And then that led to foot archery eventually, like 18 years later, you know? So would you travel around and do that? 
yeah, yeah, around I used Australia. To travel around Australia and the UK and Scotland okay. and uh, do like the festival circuits with a little street performance show. So uh-huh. I had like a forty minute show on the street, and you would hat people at the end, and yeah, I'd shoot my bow and arrow with like a suction cup arrow. Okay. On and I hope I'm explaining. So would like right. the events hire you as like a performer? Yeah, so I did a few different avenues. I would do like corporate events and festivals and then also like street performing. Okay. Yeah. That's funny. I I actually have a food service business in the U.S. where we do events and there's always different performers that they bring in that have their different acts. And so uh, that's that's funny. I I have not seen one that unique, though. Yeah, certainly a couple of us now. (laughs) So you were doing that in Australia. Yeah. And are you still involved in that or in Costa Rica or is that something that you kind of left behind? Um, It's still like a hobby of mine. Um, It's just not like my main passion or drive or work anymore. But I think yeah. you should have done that at the Adopting Bitcoin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it's um, still relevant. I broke the world record like 11 months ago. So it was very small. Wow. Yeah. So did you guys meet uh, while you were performing or how did you guys meet? We met, I used to do film and photography um, on Instagram. So I used to travel the world creating content for brands and we were both in Australia at a certain time. And And you're both Australian, correct? Yeah. yeah. And then we linked up through, she was into contortion and... I was shooting, I was shooting some female like models and stuff for different brands. And I guess we just linked up and did a shoot and we were just friends for quite a few years um, until I came back from Europe one time and then we just sort of became more close and then over time developed that relationship. So, yeah. And what is your Bitcoin story? Where did that come in? Uh, 2017 for me uh, when ethereum was going through the roof and that whole to me it was like the first you know real uh market cycle that i'd sort of gotten involved in and i was traveling creating content uh on you know instagram and i just threw all my money at the time pretty much into bitcoin ethereum just a, a bunch of others and i rode up that entire cycle cycle and made a lot of money and then i lost most of it after that but it was enough to sort of enough of a stimulus to sort of really go like dive in really deep into it and, and learn more about you know the philosophy and just more about money and finance and it just you know i just never really left the industry I, I came from a from an influencer content creation social media sort of a background and then I just came in and just started applying all my skill sets to the industry you know trying to find projects that I liked at the time I wasn't just Bitcoin but you know it's just I also did graphic design and film and all these different things kind of like a perfect skill set for any startup um, and yeah, just continue to learn and um, develop, you know, my understanding of, of how all of this works and yeah, never really left the industry from that. And what did you think the first time you started talking to you about Bitcoin? I didn't listen uh, to begin with, but I think a few years later when we developed our relationship and got closer, I was spending more time with him and listening and learning more. But yeah, it was a really big help for me to have somebody like hold my hand and like show me resources and kind of what I needed in my journey learning about it. And so you guys were together during the lockdown in Australia. Mm. What was that like where you were at? I know in some parts it was insane, other Mm. places it was more mellow. Yeah, we're lucky enough to live on an island off the mainland. So we were kind of, you know, removed from the hustle and bustle of the mainland, you know, like a lot of the restaurants and cafes that were like shutting down, you needed like an app to get into clubs and bars and like, you know, just full on tracking and all the rest of it. But because we were sort of removed from it all, we, and, you know, we would come off the island to go to like the weekend farmer's markets and get all of our food and stuff there. And then we'd just sort of like go back to the market. So it was, it was almost like we had our own little island and like 
it didn't affect us in the same way that it probably affected most people. So was life pretty normal on that island? Like how many people was, live on the island? A few hundred. Oh, wow. So it's yeah. a small, very small. It's a small, small island. island. Well, it's a big island, but there's just only, there's a resort on it that we were living in and none of the rest of the island people are allowed to live on except for the resort. Um, so it was, yeah, there's not many people there. But, you know, still, you know, the, the, on the macro side of things, if we ever wanted to leave the country or all that sort of stuff, you know, that was still a thing. So, you know, we sort of recognized, I guess, the path that the country was taking and just didn't agree with it. So started to think that about was other what things. was crazy to me was that people couldn't leave. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to Stefan Lavera and he was trying to get to a, I think it was a Bitcoin conference he was supposed to be speaking at and they wouldn't let him out like mm -hmm. even though it was for work and he had them write a letter and they still wouldn't let him out of australia that that's where it gets scary they wouldn't even let you cross between states at yeah. one point they had the borders shut yeah, yeah. they shut down the border and, and like we had we knew of people that you know had a had a dying family me member on the other side of the border like 10 minutes away in a hospital and they weren't allowed to go visit them while they're dying and stuff it's just like absolutely ridiculous yeah but most australians were for this correct or no i mean it's hard for a lot of people to understand you know what's going on around the world and on a macro sort of scale and it's all new and the fear is getting pumped through the media and sort of like people don't know what to think you know so it's, it's hard but i think more so now a lot more information has come out and a lot more people are like this is you know like the rest of the world this is very scammy <laughs> so do you think now that that most australians realize how crazy it was or do you think most people are still like no we did the right thing what do you think um i almost feel like there was this like collective trauma that has made people like forget about the experience to some degree like this amnesia but a lot of people have you know, woken up and have said, you know, I've taken three, four shots and I'm not taking any more because I realize and like you're hearing more of those cases, but it's hard to um, dissect, you know, everyone in the country because mm. can you really trust like the statistics that they're yeah. giving us? And Yeah, because we, we're stuck in our little bubble, you know, of like how we think and then our friends are all thinking the same, you know, so it's like how are the normies thinking? I don't know. And they, they're, they're all getting vaxxed. They're all still, you know, so. I was surprised at how many people, friends of mine that I thought were very rational, like fell into it. Mm. But now I've seen a lot of them. They're like, no, I was never for the lockdowns. I was mm. never like thought we should mandate vaxxes. I'm like, you see these posts right here. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. People are very easily steered down direction. People don't know what to think, you know, so they yeah. get told what to think. So what is the Bitcoin community like in Australia? Did you guys have much connection with, with other Bitcoiners? Not really. I mean, I think it's still very, it's very crypto focused, you know, like Bitcoin, like specific communities are, are a lot smaller. I mean, it's growing everywhere all around the world, but there's just like, there's no way of spending a Bitcoin. There's no like Bitcoin farmers markets or people that are actually like, using it you know um so when we started to find out more about costa rica and you know what's happening in el salvador is like well it's like a guiding light sort of like well this is very interesting to us we're very passionate about you know what bitcoin is and what it means for humanity moving forwards and you know we want to support that with our energy you know like it's i think it's very important that we all start thinking like that you know like opting out of the fiat and stop giving us, um, giving that it's our energy and, you know, redirect it and you know, start building alternate systems that we are directly supporting, you know, with our energy. So, yeah. so you guys found out that you were pregnant and you were still in Australia at that time. Mm -hmm. And was what was happening here in El Salvador, like with Bitcoin, did that play any role in you guys deciding to to move this direction? And had you thought before about, hey, if if we were to have a child, we would want to move somewhere else to get a second passport. It sounds, seemed like that was something driving 
your guys' decision was <laughs> wanting to have a second passport. Yeah, yeah, correct. Um, so when we were about six months pregnant, we came across uh, birth tourism, which is where you essentially give birth in another country and the child is granted permanent, sorry, the child is granted citizenship. And then in many of the countries, parents also granted permanent residency with a pathway to citizenship. Um, so there are like 31 countries around the globe that offer this uh, under the term just soli, which means right of soil. Um, so yeah, once we found out that we were pregnant, we realized this was an incredible opportunity to invest in our family and our child's future and generations to come. And, um, yeah, setting up like a second base, uh, a plan B and yeah, we wanted to choose a country that had Bitcoin as a part of it. Um, the top five countries that we were deciding on were either Mexico, Brazil, Costa Rica. We considered El Salvador definitely, and then Argentina. But yeah, they all have different like um, like different terms and conditions, and like the pathway to citizenship is much smaller in in some countries. And and yeah, we just weighed up a lot of different factors before we decided on Costa Rica. So how did it work in Costa Rica? It's just automatic and then is that conveyed to you guys in any form or how does that work yeah so typically if you want to become a citizen in costa rica you need to apply through their citizenship by investment programs which can cost up to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars per application to invest in the country's real estate or something else um or you can give birth there and the child is granted citizenship and then through family unification parents can also get permanent residency Okay. Yeah. So it's like a an investment. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's 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 a little bit uh, I, probably a little bit unusual. You see that a lot in the U.S. People coming mm. from, un, you know, underdeveloped countries tr coming to the U.S. to give birth for that reason. Mm. But probably not a lot of Australians are going somewhere else. So, so that's uh, you guys are kind of groundbreaking as far as that goes. And have you seen? I know, I know you guys put out a lot of content. Have you? had followers that are like, wow, this is amazing. I'm going to go do this. Yeah, it's pretty divisive. A lot of people don't understand um, like why you would want to move to like a developing country, but the people that get it really like think it's a clever idea. And there's a lot of Americans and Canadians and Australians moving to like Latin America. Yeah, we've definitely seen a huge influx, especially of Canadians here. Yeah. It's been really... I think there's as many Canadians as there are Americans, which in the U.S. population is like 10 times out of Canada. So you'd think it would be proportional, but definitely mm. not at all. Mm. Yeah. And the way that we, I guess, document our life, you know, this whole moving over here and the birth tourism stuff is obviously a part of it. And so um, we've been able to document that side of things and sort of, you know, create some educational content around the thing. And the more people that we've spoken to, you know, we started to realize that not many people really like understand the idea of birth tourism, you know, like they, they haven't really thought about the concept, which is quite surprising to us. So we kind of thought that there was potentially an opportunity to, because we were doing all the research in all these different countries and, you know, there's a, a lot of different, a lot. <laughs> a lot of stuff, right, that you've got to try to weigh up. You need the contacts to the midwives if, you know, you're wanting to do a, a home birth or, you know, doctors. And probably some of the countries don't allow home births. Yeah. yeah they even recognize midwifery yeah. as like a legal profession. It's like, well, how do you find the, the yeah. practicing midwives who are like well, I know certified. even in El Salvador, I don't think they recognize midwives because one of my good friends, his wife's right now in a midwif midwifery program and she wanted to come to El Salvador, but she's like, they don't, they mm. don't allow it. So. That was one of the reasons why we didn't give birth here because yeah. it's not quite there yet. But, um, yeah, so with the deep dives we were doing all, on all the countries, well, we thought, well, this is like a perfect, like, product. This is something that we can actually, you know, create and, you know, um, it's it's a great educational resource for people that want to do the same thing. Um, but as we started putting content out there to the world about the subject matter, it started to cop like a lot of heat um, from, you know, people in, in Central America that just didn't agree with it. Um, like like calling Costa it, Ricans or what? Uh, all kinds of uh, Spanish-speaking 
people in Latin America, you know, really? from all across. Yeah, yeah. like in labeling us way. as like, like, it, like gentrifiers these... and colonizers and um, yeah, not really like agreeing with immigration to Latin America. But it's, it's so, so ironic. We saw that some during COVID when the, the borders here were, were locked down. It was very serious lockdown. They went way overboard. And there was people sneaking in. Yeah. And it was, I was laughing because you read these comments. They're like, they should shoot them if they sneak across the border illegally. Like they shouldn't. And, and considering the history in El Salvador mm -hmm. with how many people go to the U.S. illegally, it was just ironic to see them kind of turn on their head and, and be time and like what, what we experienced was like like hardcore like hatred like real like deep dark you know like yeah it was interesting because coming from australia we're not like aware of you know we understand the history but like you know us being on the other side of the planet it's just sort of different but like coming here and sort of yeah it's really interesting like these videos got like tens of millions of hit, like, hits like like you know we're getting hit up for interviews on nbc C cbs like all the big news stations back in australia and all the big like yeah it was it really cre created some some attention which was really interesting for us did you find that it was different, like the the hatred that you got online versus what you saw in person? Because a lot of times, yes. that's what you see is the people yep. online. It's a small minority, but they're mm. very vocal mm. and they get crystallized on something. Yeah. But you know, then you meet the the average people that you're living around, and like, mm. oh, that's amazing! You came here to have you, your yeah, baby. Like, right. You want to have a. Yep. You want to, you know, be a citizen of here. Well, it seemed like it was definitely a younger demographic like beneath 30 kind of like the brainwashed like wokies that yeah. have been like messed with in school and potentially university that you know um but yeah you're 100 right like in real life we've not met one person even you know local costa ricans or you know like the the locals here in el salvador have also been you know absolutely amazing so don't see it in real life but online <laughs> yeah so did that have an impact on you guys? Was it hard to have that coming at you all the time? Um, yeah, usually I'm pretty good at like switching off uh, comments. Like I don't really read them, mm -hmm. but just because of the volume, um, it's certainly like an interesting position to be in. Yeah, you've like just moved to this country and your child is a citizen there and there's this, yeah. this very vocal group online. Um, We're getting reported to like child pr protective services and all sorts of stuff. Really? Not for yeah. doing anything wrong, just like people out of like, you know, how can I get them mentality. Were they people actually in Costa Rica or were they like reporting you from abroad? Who knows? Definitely uh, in Costa Rica for sure. I mean, okay. one of the videos on Twitter got like 9 million hits. So, you know. 9 and, million? Yeah. And for reference, there's only a thousand likes. So that ratio is significant. Mm, <laughs> not a good. And how many comments? Oh. Uh, a lot a lot of <laughs> reposts and yeah mm. yeah super interesting it's so funny because these same people if someone were to go to the u.s to have from central america to have a kid and you were to well, make comments like that they would call you racist and all these other things so it's, well that's it's, what they say they'll say you know like if we go and do it we we get called you know illegal immigrants but then when white people come and do it it's called birth tourism or like it's okay or it's trendy or something you know like so, so it's they flip everything yeah you know absolutely everything but it is all stems from pure ignorance like they don't understand how economies work they don't understand how important humans are to a country you yeah. know like humans are literally traded on you know it's like yeah so they some of these people are just living very miserable lives and they need somebody to blame right so you know we we come to these countries and they see us with all our money but the thing is is we're spending our money there yeah you know like it's we're not, benefiting the locals mm. absolutely and most know? most of them like you said in person most of them all get that but you always mm. have those i see that here in el salvador and the funny thing is it's usually ones it's usually Salvadorans who have left El Salvador, lived in the U.S. for lots of years, made their money there, mm. and have come back. 
and and they have like a chip on their shoulder now. It's weird. Mm. It's, but the majority of Salvadorans, they're like mm. stoked that mm. all these people are coming in here and mm. want to be part of El Salvador and want to contribute to the society. Mm. Mm. It's certainly a different dynamic here, though, in El Salvador, because like not uh, because Costa Rica has had, a, you know, a lot of expats moved yeah. there over the years. And it's it's probably a little bit more recent here, but. You know, it seems like it's, they, they're more welcoming, like they want it to happen, you know, mm. more. Yeah, I think it's time. a big difference, even online. Like uh, yeah. when I posted um, some videos about our experience in El Salvador, my feed was just filled with El Salvadorians, like welcoming yeah. me to the country. Yeah, whereas welcome. like, yeah. I don't know, that definitely didn't happen in Costa Rica. Mm. But, but overall, you guys have had a positive experience living in Costa Rica? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful country and we really enjoyed it. You know, beautiful people. Community. We've had a really, yeah, really great yeah. experience. And, you know, the, the Bitcoin jungle is, you know, the crew down there with the app, you know, really spreading the word and, and getting lots of restaurants, cafes, um, the local farmers markets. You know, we spend 85% of the money we spend in the country is bitcoin really yeah it's mm -hmm. that like um yeah francis from bull bitcoin they've just connected sinpay to bitcoin jungle so now you know it's like sinpay is like a venmo for for costa rica so. yeah he was we we did a show with him uh last week and he was explaining just how seamlessly it works like, yeah wow. yeah so That's you can amazing. just use you know like we go to the, the farmer's market and most of them are all accepting Bitcoin. Um, and for the ones that don't, they'll all, all have SimPay. So yeah, it's super, super cool. And how have you found spending Bitcoin here versus Costa Rica? Have you seen any major differences or did it feel pretty similar or what's the? Uh, it definitely feels like it's more like easy here. Like most of the convenience stores and like you know, people are accepting it mm. more so than, than Costa Rica. It's it. I mean, our little area in the southern zone, lots of people are accepting it, but like it doesn't really spread out too much outside of that. You know, but it's a little small pocket that's yeah. really growing. Um, well, it's newer there. It started a little absolutely. bit later than here. So, yeah. but I've been impressed by the growth there. Yes. Mm. And it's been like what's what's awesome about it is it's really been from like ground up organic emergence. You know, like. Um, it's happened just by the will of the people, you know, um, I guess here in El Salvador has been more from like a top down sort of from the government, which is great. I mean, it's all happening. Um, but from Costa Rica, it's been yeah, a slightly different way, but yeah. yeah, it's cool. So it's interesting for me. I always like to ask people what their experience has been in Bitcoin because you see posts online and people are like, no, oh, it's not really used in El Salvador. You can't mm. spend Bitcoin. And then other people are like, no, it was easy to to you so what have you had like what have what percentage of places that you guys have tried to spend that would you say you've been able to to use bitcoin or have Can you I had a number them? of yeah have you had a number of them where you weren't able to or what, what's been your there experience was, in general one server that we uh service Sorry. station that we went to that didn't accept it which was i think the texaco but then we just drove up the road and there was a, a puma i think that was accepting it yeah um so but that was like the only place i mean we 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 seek out the places that yeah. do to support them you know like the the pupusaria mm. pupusaria how do you say it pupusaria that's the one yeah, yeah. you know we'll, we'll go find the local guys obviously we've gone to the bitcoin markets they're all accepting it so yeah we try our best to support the guys that are yeah. doing it, you know yeah yeah, yeah it's uh it's funny because you'll have the same group of you have one group of people and there'll be one person in that group that's totally disappointed and the other one that's like, wow, this is way more than I expected. So mm -hmm. a lot of it just depends on your expectations mm -hmm. on, on what it means. But you can definitely live on uh, Bitcoin only of course. here. I mean, it's up to you. Yeah. Like, it's like you can go and find the places or you cannot, you know, like, so you can't expect everybody to get it straight away. You know, yeah. like it's it's a big thing for a business and, and the smaller businesses, you know, like the, the cash flow and all the rest of it, you know, like you, it's part of it. Yeah. No, mm. there's definitely some some practical challenges that, mm. that we have to be cognizant of. Mm. Um, but I'm curious, are, are you producing content also? Not so much anymore. Okay. Yeah. I'm sort of working more on the sort of back end on the business side of things. Yeah. And with... Like, do you do you have people ask questions when you're posting stuff about Bitcoin, or what is the 
what's the general reaction? I, I mean, I know Twitter's very like Bitcoin mm. friendly, but when you're on Instagram or TikTok, like what is the reaction that you get? Yeah, there's just so much to address. Like uh, I get a lot of comments of people saying, you know, they didn't even know that you could use Bitcoin like in reality, that there was just this like internet money. Yeah. Um, a lot of people just ask like why, um, a lot of people question why you would use it rather than just hold it. Um, yeah, just a lot of the basic questions, which is great for me because um, just by like filming myself paying for something at the cafe with with Bitcoin, it's really like, you know, getting it out there that it can be used and it's happening and it's functional and it's like um, repeating this to an audience of people who like mm. – um, aren't really exposed to it or like wouldn't really seek out Bitcoin content is like, in my opinion, very beneficial. And do you have like people that follow your content that are kind of put off by it? Because sometimes it seems, I don't know, it's weird. Sometimes Bitcoin can seem divisive to people. Mm. I, I don't know. I don't know why that sometimes, I don't know if that's just in El Salvador because sometimes it's linked to the politics, but have you had that experience at all? Yeah, mostly from like the... Um, kind of a little bit too conspiratorial side of people you know saying you know bitcoin is cia that kind of route that, really? those arguments yeah what else do they well, say i mean it's all the the same like arguments you know well, what if the internet gets turned off or what if you know they do a yeah, complete <laughs> power you know it's and then so like well you know you just don't really it's all it's anything, all the right? same questions but it's just on repeat and you know these it's just i mean you know we started Bitcoin culture, which is like a Bitcoin media business to really sort of like, because we specialize in content and telling stories, getting, you know, entering the minds of a lot of, you know, we get 50, 60 million impressions a month through our channels. 50 or 60 million. Yeah. Wow. Um, we have a, you know, a really amazing opportunity to be able to like, you know, I think within the Bitcoin space at the moment, it's like everybody's talking to each other and it's not like the media isn't great you know like it's it's too complex it's too like macroeconomic or it's too you know just about finance i think like there's a lot of room to really be able to improve on you know telling better stories and you know finding things that are connected to bitcoin but you know not just talking about bitcoin um so like really trying to meet people where they're at with their problems in life and, and trying to you know, speak to them in their own ways that they're going to be able to resonate with and understand and, and then be able to sort of connect and link Bitcoin into the equation for them. And it's sort of just, um, so yeah, we're really excited to be able to sort of, you know, help get Bitcoin out to the world in different ways, more entertaining, more educational, but it's not just about Bitcoin, you know, it's like, because Bitcoin's got so many different layers and elements to it that it's just so many things to be able to talk about, which is which is fun. And you know, Shannon has such a massive audience that it's it's all very much connected. So yeah, it's fun. And so this is a newsletter people can subscribe to. Yeah, we have a we have a newsletter. Yeah, and just like a Twitter okay. account as well. Yeah. And are most of those people Bitcoiners, or do you have a lot of crossover of people that are not really interested in that space prior, but now because of they're seeing this stuff that they. Yeah, I think it's a mixture of both. I think there's a lot of curiosity there and people subscribe to learn more about it. And then there's also the Bitcoin is it, you know, like uh, content that we put out. Yeah. Okay. So is this, are you guys able to kind of move around and support yourself through this? This is like your ongoing business. I know you guys do retreats too. How does that all come together for you? Yeah, um, we're not really monetizing the newsletter. Yeah, okay. it's got around 10,000 subs, but we definitely could move into that. Um, it's really just like a, a side project for us. I mean, it seems like for Bitcoin companies that want to reach out to kind of oh, yeah. people that are on the periphery, that, that you guys would be perfect for that mm. because you're reaching people that are outside the little bubble that That's a lot of us all, exist in. Yeah, we're all yeah. trying to grow Bitcoin. And yeah. it's, you know, we've got to start thinking about how we can connect with people outside the space. Um, so, yeah. You know, one day we'll start to do monetize the newsletter as we sort of begin to develop it. But yeah, I mean, our main focus at the moment are the community, the creator retreats. Mm. So tell us about the creator retreats. 
Yeah, so the health and wellness uh, retreats for content creators, creators, entrepreneurs, business owners, and fringe thinkers. Um, as you can see, yeah, yeah. Our next one is in February in Costa Rica, which is really exciting. Um, Sunny and I host them. It's yoga. And have meditations. you done some in Costa Rica already? Yeah, yeah, we've done two. And are most of the people coming from outside of Costa Rica or are there people already living there? Or what's your No, I've got a global attendee? audience, but um, I'd say a large majority are coming from the US. Yeah, it's really easy to fly down to Costa Rica on this side of the world. Yeah, so we, we have a pretty large creative community online. Um, there's 500 people or so in it. We have it on a separate pa platform called school.com. And, you know, we just really try to provide as much value as we can to the creator community. And one of those things is we, you know, I guess after you start to get, you know, that amount of monthly views and, you know, really large following, um, you really start to think about, you know, how can I like uh, bring this online audience and create a community out of it and then really be able to sort of activate it, you know, and to do that, to really build connection and relationships Strong ones, you need to be able to bring that into real life at some point. So, you know, to really build the, the community aspect side of things, we started to do these in real life events and we've just gotten really great feedback from it. People have really enjoyed, you know, what it is that we're doing and we sort of treat them as like creator masterminds. You know, like we think that we're in a really interesting time at the moment where, you know, a lot of the old systems are starting to fall away. One of those being the educational system, you know, like school university all of these things are just like kind of crumbling down in front of our eyes and it's like well you know who are the people that are going to be stepping up and you know educating humanity we feel like that you know masters in their arts have never had the potential to really you know ha like speak to people at scale like they do now through the internet um so, you know, we really want to focus on creating, you know, a container for these creators that are all sort of, you know, heading in the same direction where we can all come together and, you know, find alignment with where it is that we're heading and be able to, you know, uh, really work together and sort of spiral up together and flourish and, you know, focus on the foundational stuff, meditation, uh, breath work, ice baths, you know, yoga, all the good stuff, and then really just, you know, help each other. In, yeah. So is it more of like focused on the health side, or are you like talking about marketing things for content creators, or what? Like, what would an average day look like, and and how long do these retreats go for? A weekend? Is it a week? What's yeah? What's it goes it look like? for, goes for a week. Um, so we. We've done a lot of like surveying with creators, like asking them, like, what are the biggest, you know, problems that you face as a creator? And, you know, after you ask enough people, you start to, you know, these like trends begin to develop. And seemingly most of these creators are falling into three different categories. One is they're either a really good creator, they're either really good at business and operations, or they're good at sales and marketing. It's very rare that, you know, these creators will be able to put all three hats on and really be able to sort of excel. But that's what's sort of required to be able to scale yourself as a creator. And so, um, you know, we sort of saw an opportunity there where we can create a place and a container for these creators to be able to come together, to be able to collaborate and find the missing piece to their puzzle to be able to, you know, because if you're a good creator, you might not want to be, you know, a great sales and marketing yeah, person yeah, yeah. or like operations. Or, this is two different like personality types. Your, your, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mindset. Exactly. Um, so yeah, we just I think there's a lot of power in being, you know, a connector. And you know, we So at these retreats will people with different skill sets like come, come together, together. Yeah, we do like one on teams. one yeah, one on one like business breakdowns where, you know, creator will get up and they'll talk about their business and, you know, where they want to go, what their mission is. And then, you know, we might have like a brainstorming session around their particular business and, you know, we can maybe all add value or whatever and then we'll do some master classes where we get you know professionals that you know somebody that's like really good 
you know, like we had Jeremy at our last one. He sold a billion dollars worth of media. You know, he's a really great uh, ads guy. And so he'll get up and do, you know, like a master class on, on how to utilize paid ads to, to, you know, increase revenue and all the rest of it. So um, it's really, yeah, it's focused on connection and just, you know, getting together as creators and, and sharing insights. And um, yeah. And how many people usually? Around 16. Okay. So it's a pretty intimate group and yeah. you get to know each other pretty well. Exactly. 16 seems to be like the sweet spot. You know, we could get 24, but it's just a little bit too many. And is it generally like a younger crowd or do you have people mm. across the spectrum? Or Yeah, pretty broad actually. Um, we've, we've had some some older guys in and some, some younger people. Okay. Um, yeah. Older, like as old as me? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We no. in, in their fifties. We've had a, we've had some people come through in their fifties. Okay, yeah. not quite fifty yet. Pushing fifty. Shannon, you could you can bring him in if you want. Yeah, but <laughs> what's happening? None of my babies were that well behaved. I mean, they would have been screaming their their heads off right now. Yeah. So, do you guys enjoy doing the retreats? Is it draining? I mean, what have you found? No, I love it. I love community and building these relationships, and I always get a, a lot out of the experience. Um, I find, if he wants the microphone. Yeah, same. <laughs> Try not to let him. Um, yeah, I really love it. It's something that I definitely want to do more of. And yeah, I think Sunny was mentioning how we realize how important it is to bring people together in real life, especially yeah. after all the pandemic. And yeah, it's certainly a big driver when you get such positive feedback coming from the retreats as well. So, yeah, it can yeah. be a little bit uh, isolating being a, a content creator, you know, like. We ha our friends are all around the world. It's it's very unlikely that you're going to have, you know, like a, a content creator that lives next door sort of a thing. So to give that opportunity to these guys to sort of come together and obviously it's it's kind of like the Bitcoin community, you know, like you, yeah. you, you come together from everywhere and as soon as you get in the same place, like you all just sink in and like you're all friends because you're all thinking you've got the same ideologies you're all you know you have this sort of common level of understanding about things so yeah it's super powerful and you know we get 10 5 to 10 million collective followers under one roof and like really awesome stuff happens it's like a it's a it's a an opportunity fun factory for us all and you know yeah it's good Stuff. That's what I love about living in El Salvador is you have like, it's like a nonstop, I tell people it's like a nonstop Bitcoin conference mm. because you have so many people that are living, you know, Bitcoiners have moved here, but you also have tons of people that are just passing through all the time. And so that was part of the reason we decided to start this podcast. Exactly. Yeah. We have all these like amazing people yep. with, you know, unique stories passing through. So mm. we didn't want to miss that opportunity. No, it's very smart to do what you've done. We're thinking about doing the same in Costa Rica, but we're not a hundred percent sure where we want to like commit to long term. Because obviously, you know, this is this is a commitment, yeah. And you need to know if you're going to be there for longer than twelve months, sort of thing, you know. Yeah, and it's I think too finding your your niche because mm. there's are you thinking about doing something in the Bitcoin space or, or uh, in the it would be like space? health, wealth, and sovereignty okay. sort of podcast. Yeah, but like obviously. You know, where we know a lot of Bitcoiners and, and that's like one of our content pillars for sure. Yeah. So is this your guys' first trip to El Salvador? And what has kind of surprised you or what have you found? I've never been to Costa Rica. It's like the one country in Central America I've never been to. So what would you say are like the primary differences between here and Costa Rica? Uh... I, I think one of the main things that stands out for me is like I love Costa Rica so much it's so beautiful love the community I just feel like um a different level of like safety here like I feel really safe walking around the streets and, and I know that's such a like personal opinion like what is safety like what makes you feel that yeah. way but there's something here that like is really yeah that's interesting. I've heard that from a few people and it's ironic because if 
if you would have predicted that a couple of years ago, that people mm. would say that. Because mm. um, El Salvador has gotten continually safer, but I have heard, and you never, you know, I, I don't like to tr trust what I hear in the media, but mm. I have heard that things have gotten a lot less safe in Costa Rica, that there's a lot of drug running through there, and mm. that it's not that it's off the charts, but that it's there are areas where they. Yeah, it's, it's, hard to know i mean and you can choose to like focus on all that stuff or just sort of like not really you know you can let the fear, fear get involved and let it affect yeah. you or just sort of like choose to it's hard to know yeah. yeah do you guys do any bitcoin activities or anything in the retreats or is that kind of a separate space no definitely this is this is part of our master plan to to increase uh exposure to bitcoiners so we'll get you know really high level influences that come in and then we'll we'll allocate a spot to sort of bitcoin so for february um you know we will get govinda one of the founders um to come in and do a talk on bitcoin and we'll get everybody to download the bitcoin jungle app and then i'll send them you know 50 bucks each through lightning so they can get to experience it how fast it is and then we'll take them to the you know the local markets the next day or something and then they can go and spend that bitcoin buy some stuff and just go through the whole process um, and then be able to experience it and, and then eat the food that they yeah. just bought, you know, the organic fresh food. And um, it's super powerful for people to sort of get shown that and go through the process and then, you know, walk away with something tangible. And then, you know, they've it's on the path to getting orange filled, you know, and then um, so that's sort of part of our plan, you know, to get these yeah. other big influences to come in then get them yeah. and what is what is their general reaction like do they are they kind they of surprised it. by how easy it is yes and how absolutely well it works and... i mean people just don't like they still don't understand it's just so much work that we need to do you know like they don't even understand you can what lightning is yeah. you know like you can go and buy a coffee then like oh well it doesn't do you know the block yeah it's like it's so far to go but but if you just get them to use it, that's what I've always yeah. found before I like before I try to explain anything about Bitcoin, just have them do a transaction first, because then they're like, oh, well, any idiot can do this. This is easy because a lot of times otherwise they feel like oh, I'm not a tech person. That's right. But that's once they sharp. like make a transaction, they realize like, wow, this just works. Yeah. And do you have much follow up with people after the retreats? Like, have you seen them become? more interested in bitcoin and kind mm. of go down the definitely yeah. the rabbit hole one of our yoga teachers that comes in dakota maze um he's got 1.4 million followers or something um he's yeah got you know right into bitcoin after that and took it back to sort of salulita in mexico and it's a fairly small little beach town and yeah. you know he's been going into the local restaurants and you know like orange pilling them and getting them involved to accept bitcoin because he's a little bit of a celebrity in that little area you know and so like you know he's they, they go back to their respective places and tell their friends and it's just you know th that network effect and then if they can actually start talking about it on their socials as well then you know that's what we need more of Okay. Yeah. So is this this is one of the retreats? Yeah, this is at Salvador Ammonia in uh, Costa Rica. Uh, it's a really beautiful sort of eco lux resort. We hire out the full resort for the week. Um, the guys that own this also run Envision Festival, which is this really amazing um, arts, culture, music festival that goes for a week long um, in Costa Rica. So oh, in yeah, it's super cool. And then coming up, you have another one in Costa Rica and then one in El Salvador. Yeah, right? February, May in Costa Rica. Okay. And then, then we're going to potentially maybe uh, partner up with Swan and do one here in El Salvador and Mazata. Okay. In yeah. August. In August. No, just, yeah. So when will that one be open if people are interested? Uh, now, yeah, we take, we take applications okay. for next year and we just open them up, yeah. I'm assuming you guys usually fill up... Uh, decent decent amount beforehand yeah yeah we get a lot of applications and then we just you know jump on video calls with everybody get to know them so we can really curate like the yeah best okay so so people have to actually apply to participate yeah
Yeah, it's very much like what we're trying to achieve is like, you know, really high value group of people that, you know, then we don't have to do anything, you know, like we can just step back and the magic just happens. Yeah. You get the right people in the place and it's just like our job's kind of been done, you know. Yeah, you've got like the smaller things, but like that's that's where the real power lies. That's what people walk away with are these like, mm -hmm. you know, strong connections and the stuff that we've seen develop after these retreats is just like so cool, yeah. So have you guys had any luck connecting with with like Bitcoin companies as far as helping them broaden the audience and and connect with people I, that you guys are used to interacting with? I think a lot of the the Bitcoin companies through through the bear market don't have a lot uh, of marketing budget to yeah. think about um and a lot of them don't really get it either. I think for it's it's yeah it's difficult mm -hmm. to sort of i we were talking to jimmy song the other night actually on the way back from catching up with max and stacy and as content content creators in the bitcoin space it's it's hard to like monetize yourself you know because there's like not not many of these bitcoin companies are really thinking about you know like different ways to market themselves like how many ways do you really have to market yourself these days as a business you know um and We've spoken to a couple, but I think they just lack the the marketing budget or like the ability to sort of connect why what we're doing is so powerful for yeah. not only them, but the ecosystem at large, you know. It's it kind of surprising to me. Well? I'm sorry, what? Quantifying it as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's what most businesses are looking for. They're like, well, you know, like what's their product, number one, and then like, you know, how much are they investing and then what's their return going to be on that? And it it's, it's varies a lot for product types and you know um they might want to give you an affiliate link or something and then that, and then we've got to try to like sell the product and it gets pretty complicated but yeah. like there's a lot of value for it like like we know how to get in front of people really really well and you know tell really great stories it's just you know, it is what it is yeah yeah huh? It's kind of surprising because I, I mean, I know how much they spend to like be at the Bitcoin conference in Miami yeah. and these things that you're kind of have a limited audience and it's the same people that yeah i mean how many people are going to an event in you know bitcoin miami well how many people do go to like three thousand uh, well i think the bitcoin miami they may get i think they get like twenty thousand oh, twenty thousand i think this yeah. last year it might have been a little bit smaller mm. but i mean if you have a booth there you're only going to see a fraction uh, of yeah. those people yeah and most of them are probably people that already knew about yeah. your product so it seems yeah. like with what you guys do you exposed to you know, a whole new audience mm. yeah we've got some fantastic ideas like to be able to incorporate you know like between businesses and companies you know Especially like as we travel around the yeah. Areas. yeah there's so much cool stuff that you know like we we've been staying with john from from swan uh bitcoin and he talks about how like you know to, to get bitcoin out to the world we need to be like living this like lifestyle that is awesome that like represents like a bitcoin a lifestyle right that's like you know super healthy doing all, all the stuff that's like um you know like freedom sovereignty health you know just like living this ultimate lifestyle and then getting that out to the world and sort of connecting this lifestyle with bitcoin and people go oh this guy's living this like really great life and he's into bitcoin like what's this like correlation sort of thing there you know so like we feel like that with what we're doing, we've got some really cool ideas with, you know, creating some some YouTube series about, you know, diving into, you know, telling the stories of the locals, you know, doing cool stuff with Bitcoin, like the, the markets and, you know, like the, the Bitcoin uh, coffee. What What's his? Yeah. Chirito? Yeah. Chirito. Um, yeah, there's just so much like cool stuff, you know, like volcano energy, really cool thing we, we go out to and like document all of this stuff and, you know, get in front of a lot of people because, yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Mm. Well, how can, if people are interested in this, what's the best way for them to connect with you guys? I'm assuming you're both on Twitter. Um, I'm not really an Instagram person, but I'm sure in your world that's big. So um, where can they, how can they find you? Shannon Michaela on Twitter. Mm, yeah. Shannon Pill is my username. Shannon Field? Shannon Pill. Pill. Shannon Pill. Okay. Yes. I'm sure on Twitter. Search Shannon Michaela will find you as well. Yeah, and the many, many, many other 
spam accounts. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you have a lot of those uh, scam mm -hmm. accounts that... Uh... Countless. Just goes on forever. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it either. Because yeah. I don't use... it. I have an Instagram account, but I never post anything. So there's a scam Instagram of Bitcoin Beach that has like three times as many followers wow. as we have. So people think it's the right, the, you know, the real one because it has more followers. So yeah. I had a friend that the exact same thing happened to and his account got deleted. They like the, the scam account reported his account and he's the one that got deleted and they, they kept really? his alive. Yeah. So I thought his was a scam account. <laughs> it's right. wild. Yeah. That's one of the things that is frustrating about this type of content is you're just always battling that. And then you, mm -hmm. it's just sad stories of people getting scammed and you're just like, okay, don't, mm -hmm. I'll never ask you for money. I'll never ask you to send, but that's, yeah, they get vicious. I had this mm -hmm. last year, somebody hacked my email, sent out this thing specifically saying, hey, we're doing these economic development projects in El Salvador, you know, help us out. Fortunately, they put an ETH address in there too, so people knew it wasn't from me. <laughs> so, Rookie era. Yeah, that was how they screwed up. But yeah, they are, they are vicious, uh, vicious. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you guys coming in. I, I, I won't keep you any longer because I know uh, your little one's getting uh, antsy here and probably wants to get back out in the sun. But mm. I'm excited to see people like you coming into this space and, and bringing new faces into it because mm. we really do need that it mm. it can't be the same you know small enclave of us just doing the same thing all the time so yeah. i think that's important and for people that are out there i'm hoping some of them that are watching this will join you guys for the uh, event and you said it was in august mm -hmm. yes in here in el, salvador. in el salvador yeah yeah and we're super excited as well you know like we it's a it's a blue ocean out there there's so much opportunity and like to to get involved in this space and you know we we love it it's really exciting to be here now with everything that's happening around the world and um yeah let's let's hope that more people jump on the bandwagon and, and help i mean bitcoin's community is just so strong you know like i can't think of another community around the world that is this strong like can yeah. you no like and that's what's fascinating. And you just have about those it, natural so. connections with each other. Well, like it's you like, meet people for the first time, you feel like family. Anything that like we do that provides value to the community, the community gets behind, and that's what you need for any product, any business, anything. You need a strong community, and it's already organically there. You know, so like if anybody can figure out how to create value for Bitcoin, you know, they'll naturally be supported in such a strong way, and so. You know, there's so much to be done. There's so much opportunity there where we can all, you know, truly thrive and yeah. flourish and together. Look, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be technical. We have, no. We had uh, Lena on here that has a little hodler, you know, plushie. Yeah. And she's got this amazing business that she's yeah. built around that and the cartoons. And, you yeah. know, nobody would have thought that that would have been a good fit for the Bitcoin space, but Bitcoiners are excited about it and want to support her. want to support other yeah. Bitcoiners. And it's like, we, that's... Yeah, so exciting times ahead. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we'll have to uh, have you guys back in after the retreat uh, here and, and see how it, how it went. But I appreciate you coming in and bringing your son. He is so well behaved. You guys are very, very fortunate. <laughs> yeah, thanks, I Appreciate yeah. it. Thank yeah, you. Cheers. Yes.